So in this video, I want to start a talk about actual evidence for macroevolution actually taking place that we've actually observed where speciation events have taken place where a species can come from another species. So let's start by doing some examples from the plant kingdom and seeing some really cool examples of autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy as well as sympatric and allopatric speciation events that have been observed in the last hundred years. Plant evolution has been observed in the lab and in nature throughout the history of science many times. In fact, it's clear that macroevolution is a thing because plants have been shown to evolve many different situations. In 1905, a, a study being conducted on uh, evening primrose, which is called Anothera lamarckiana, identified a different variation of a, the primrose, which actually had double the number of chromosomes that the normal primrose has. You see, normally the primrose will have 14 chromosomes, but the scientists found a variant that had 28 chromosomes. And you also notice that this variant could not cross with the original, so that it seemed to be a separate species from the original, even though it looked exactly the same. What he was seeing is evidence for sympatric speciation by what we call stasipatric speciation. Basically, a chromosomal autopolyploidy took place, and I talked about this before in the previous videos, that actually led to differentiation between the species. It's very interesting. You also have a second study conducted in the 1910s where on the Abyssinian primrose, and the, this is actually a member of, of a genus called Primula, and specifically it, the species they, they observed was called Verticillata. But they noticed that whenever you put the Verticillata close to the Floribunda, which is another species of the same genus, they look very close to each other, it's not featured here, but it looks very similar to the one that you see on the top right there. When you put these two different species belonging to the same genus together and force them to cross with each other, they will make sterile hybrids, and that means they're different species. The thing is, though, that sometimes um, they made some sort of hybrid which was fertile. And they were trying to study this hybrid and realized that it had a different number of chromosomes. And again, we realized that this was a different species because if you try to cross this fertile rabbit with either of the parents, they would not be able to cross. So what they did there was allopolyploidy, and they didn't understand that yet, but they did it. And they did it three times in 1905, 1923, and 1926. Each time they created tetraploid seeds by combining each of the diploid parent offsprings. And so sometimes this poly allopolyploidy was taking place. I've also already talked about this other kind of polyploidy that they did with the Western salsify. Basically, and they noticed that in nature, there was this type of flower that looked very similar to two parent flowers. So you have a flower A, and then you had a flower B, and they noticed there's a third flower, flower C, which looked like a combination of flowers A and B. And they were wondering if there was some substantiation for that. So they actually conducted a hybridization studies when they tried to cross flowers A and B together in the lab. And they found out that, in fact, the genus Tragopogon, which included the prepared flowers A and B called uh, Mysdubius and Pratensis, all right, they were actually hybridizing together in nature to create a third flower that they called Mirus because it mirrored the traits of both plants. And there's even a second species on the same genus called the Tragopogon mycelis, which also underwent a similar hybridization process in nature. And they replicated in the lab the hybridization that happened in nature. And the interesting thing is that this hybridization the hybrid cannot cross with the parents. So it's a different species from A or B. So that means none of them can cross with each other. See, A can't really cross with B to make fertile offspring. But if you hybridize the both, in other words, if you combine the chromosomes of both to make a different species, C, C can't cross with A or with B, all right, to make fertile offspring. So they're all different species, but they came from hybridizing each other. So that's macroevolution, the birth of a new species by putting two species put together. And this is something that we've actually done in the lab. The evening primrose it was something that we observed already done. The obsidian primrose was something that we kind of did in the lab. And then the western salsify is something that happened in nature that we replicated in the lab. So it's pretty cool. We actually saw the evolution actually taking place. It was really awesome. And then, but then you might say, these are all the same genus people. So that's like too little. I want to see evolution above the genus level. Ugh, kind of complicated, would you say? No, I got one for you. A Russian cytologist called Karpenchenko, working in 1927 and 1928. By the way, anybody that says the macro evolution haven't taken place, way to be current, right? This is about almost 100 years old. It's a century ago that we figured this out. But anyways, he looked at garden radish, radishes, and he saw that 
he, when he got the radish and he crossed it with the cabbage, which, by the way, is a completely different genus. See the, you see here in the screen that the garden radish is called Raphanus sativus. The cabbage is called Brassica oleracea. So it's a completely different genus. But despite the fact that they were different genera, they got cross them together, most of the time they may sterile hybrids, as you, as you expect. You know, you, you, they're different gen genera, they're not going to be able to cross together. They're not the same same species, they're not even the same genera. But the thing is that sometimes fertile seeds were actually may be made between two of them. And he was like, what? How is that possible? And the thing is that this fertile seed was basically a hybrid, an alloploid hybrid of the, of the species. But this seed was infertile with with each other. So this seed would not be able to cross with another one just like it to, to make another children. So it wasn't really a, a, a new species. It was, you know, didn't have uh, viability, it doesn't have fertility, so it didn't qualify on post-zygotic isolation. But the funny thing is that when he got that seed, that hybrid seed, and crossed with either the radish or the cabbage, then he made a plant that was fertile. Alright? And it was, and then he, the new plant then, had a mixture of foliage of the radish and the root of the cabbage. And this was an allopoly event of combining two different species in sequential events. That's the second type of polyploidy that we talked about. So again, it basically, we created a new species by hybridizing two. And although this did not happen naturally, it exists. You can actually buy this the hybrid between the cabbage and the radish if you want to. And we've done this many times now with a lot of different kinds of plants since then. So this is a, a, a evidence of evolution because this new hybrid is infertile with either the cabbage or the rad, radish. So it's a new species. So as you see, these plant examples show you evidence of evolution in plants. But I got more for you. They, you have the hemp nettle. Now, they, people, they thought there was also a, a, the result of the hybridization of two different species of the genus Galeopsis, which is what you see in the screen. And this particular one you hear is tetrahit. It is called tetrahit because it is a, it has got, you know, visible chromosomal morphology, which is polyploidy. And so they actually looked at it and they figured out that in fact it was the combination of two other species in the same genus called Speciosia and Pubensis. So you put them together in the lab, you make something that looks exactly like the hemp nettle. In other words, a naturally occurring species is that like that. And that was discovered by another scientist in 1932. Another example, grassy tarweed. Again, it was hypothesized that this was a hexaploid hybrid of two different species, the Maria gracilis and the Maria citroodora, from the same genus. And evidence for this is because each of these species have different chromosomal numbers. The Maria gracilis has 16, the Maria uh, citroodora has 8. And then this tarweed has 24. So they thought, well, maybe the 16 plus the 8 makes the 24. That's the hexaploid. So in 1945, they try to actually cross them in the lab. And a lot of the times, they make the sterile triploid N24 uh, version that looked like the grassy tarweed. But um, the chromosomes for almost no, no uh, t uh, you know, pairing during meiosis. But... But sometimes you can create a hybrid that looks exactly like the one that you see in nature, Maria Citri Gracilis. And notice how they combined the name Citriodora with Gracilis and that made it Maria Citri Gracilis. Because in fact, it turns out that this, all of these tar weeds are actually working with each other and creating new species. So another natural example of evolution from two different species. Look at these brassicas, studied in 19, between 1943 and 1947 by another scientist called Fradzen. All right. Again, he recreated the natural hybrid by by putting different kinds together from the same from the same genus. They combine two different species to make new kinds of of, of brassicas. So, naturally occurring brassicas, all right, which include Brassica nigra, Brassica oleracea, and Brassica juncaea, may be recreated by hybridizing other simpler ones. So you see, we have in the lab we created what already happened in nature. So ev evolution made those things. And how do we know? Because we can make those things ourselves by putting the other species together. This whole plant polyploidy hybridization thing really does prove evolution. Because you see it in nature, and then you replicate it in the lab, and you do exactly what happened in nature. And so it becomes really hard for, to argue against it. There are other examples of plant polyploidy creating new species, which include the fern that you see over here in the bottom right, and 
the fern you see on the top left, I, both of them indicate uh, other polyploidy or out of polyploidy events leading to the formation of new species. Now, all the examples I gave you so far are about polyploidy. In other words, combining different species or members of the same species to actually create new species out of that. And that happens very commonly in plants. But wouldn't you like to see some type of speciation that doesn't involve the whole chromosome mass that involves autopolyploidy or allopolyploidy? Well, I have some plant examples for you about that as well. Here you see, for example, the Malure wire lattice. It's a kind of flower. And in 1973, a scientist called Gottlieb found documented speciation within a population. So it's kind of like sympatric speciation within a population that does not involve chromosomal changes. So it wasn't status patri, like the other examples that we talked about. Actually, what happened here is that one type of plants, which is the one you see over here on the top right, has the ability to cross with itself, and it has uh, no self incompatibility and the flowers will have both genders in them, and they will allow self-pollination to, to occur. The other variation, which is the more, more common in the population, almost 25,000 of these plants were major, uh, present in the population that he examined, while these were only less than 250 of the flowers in the population. The other variation, which we actually is the same genus, but it's called Ezigua, is an obligate cross-pollination. It can't pollinate itself. Even though it has both genders in the flower, it cannot self-pollinate. It will destroy alleles which look different, which looks too similar to itself, so it's forcing the flower to pollinate with other flowers. But the thing is that if you get the, the Molyrenses and you try to cross with the Exigua, they will actually make offspring between the two of them, which makes, makes you think, oh, well, I guess they are the same species. It's just a little variation within the same population. It's not, though, because the thing is that after a couple of generations, the, that, uh, that hybrid between the two of them will die off. So it doesn't have hybrid viability over long periods of time. So this is what we call the hybrid breakdown thing. So they're actually two different species, or they're in the process of speciation, completing the speciation process. The Malyrandus you see in the screen, which can self-pollinate, and it's less common to the current population, is a new variant, a new species that probably branched out by sympatric speciation from the exigua species, which is the more common of the population that he had observed. That's very interesting. So this has nothing to do with chromosome numbers. They have the same number of chromosomes and they look almost the same. It's just a small variation in the genome that caused them to be different from each other. Another study was done with the field corn and they actually found something interesting. They grew two different kinds of corn in the same kind of field. One were white and the other one was yellow and they're pretty much the same species. They were Zea maeus. But what they actually did is that they did selection against any type of hybrid. So this, this is like a laboratory study at the, at, at the size of an entire field. And what they did is that they, any time a hybrid would happen, the, the farmers would select against that hybrid and not allow the hybrid to, to, to reproduce. And they kept repeating that over many and many generations. Uh, in the fifth year of the study, okay, because of the selection that the farmers were doing, only 1% of, cro of crosses between colors was experienced. So that the flowers actually developed selective breeding. In other words, some sort of reproductive barrier developed because of this constant selection against the hybrids. So it's almost like by artificial selection, two different species of field corn that, or subspecies of field corn developed because of the pressure that they were putting uh, against any crosses between the two of them. So they were reproductively isolated, even though they were in the, within the same corn field uh, that had led to differential uh, evolution. Finally, the yellow monkey flower, they found in nature that there's two varieties of this flower. One flower that has higher tolerance to copper toxicity than the other. And the interesting thing is that these flowers can no longer uh, cross with each other and make viable offspring over many generations. It's going to do the hybrid breakdown thing we talked about. So the, the variance that is actually resistant to, to copper toxicity is evolving to a different species from the one that cannot. And this is actually only a few genes that change between one and the other because they actually did genetic analysis of that. And that's actually shown that small genetic changes can, cha can change the niche of the flower. So it's kind of like the example of that parapatric speciation that they're, ta they're, they're talking about. So you see, this is another, yet another example of evidence that we've seen in just a few generations since we started using the, the copper in that area, you know, that led to the speciation event between the two types of flowers. There were no two types of flowers before the copper became raised to the toxic levels 
in that population. So that all of these are different examples of flower evolution which show speciation.